a young woman who had been involved in witchcraft and who was supposed to take over the leadership of a coven uh, came to see me and she jumped up and started running down the, the hallway of the church, bouncing off the and wall. So I, t I took authority over him, cast the demon out of him, and he began to speak biblical Hebrew. And I said to his father, uh, did his son ever study bi biblical languages? He's growling like a dog. Arr, arr, arr. So he growled at me and I said, I, I only want to ask you two questions, John. Do you want to be set free? And he said, he growled at me and he said, yes. Welcome to The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. The ancient rite of exorcism. It may surprise you to know it's still performed to this day. But do demonic possessions actually take place? And if so, do exorcisms really work? Tonight, we'll meet a board-certified psychiatrist who insists he witnessed an authentic case of demonic possession. We'll meet an evangelical pastor who claims he's performed countless successful exorcisms. And finally, we'll also meet a skeptic who says the existence of demons is mere fantasy, and that exorcisms are a foolish and sometimes dangerous practice that belong back in the Middle Ages. Our mission tonight is to investigate these claims and follow the truth wherever it may lead. It is time to redefine reality. Genetic enigma or a human alien Mainstream media technology can alter weather patterns created by the something by the Illuminati. There's no doubt. One of the things we were told there, even though you can't study everything, uh, that whatever you read in the the Bible is true. <laughs> but I didn't expect this part to be true. <laughs> The Reverend Gordon Williams is here. Welcome to The Conspiracy Show, Reverend. Thank you very much. You've performed countless, maybe hundreds of uh, exorcisms. Yes, we lost, lost track of them many. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your training. I studied at Princeton Theological Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey for the ministry. Most ministers, priests, pastors don't even want to discuss this problem because they want to toss it aside as if this is somebody's imagination or a psychological disorder, when in fact, uh, well, many times it's not. There's, a, there's an entity there that's described in the, in the, in the Bible called uh, evil spirits or demons, which are basically the same sort of things. They will invade a person's house and harass them, or uh, will go inside them and possess them. What do they want? They want to control you. They want to destroy you. Uh, our Bible tells us that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. How common is this? It sounds like your phone is literally ringing off the hook. We get a lot of calls. Many of them are not about being, actually people who are possessed. How do you rule out mental illness? When a person is possessed, these evil spirits will imitate normal psychological, physical disorders. And the most frequent one seems to be schizophrenia. And that's big, where it gets like, kind of hard to deal with. Fortunately, I had good counseling courses, both in, in university and seminary. Uh, but apart from that, what I discovered, that one of the easiest ways to find out whether somebody is possessed is to start talking about Jesus Christ, using his name. They cause a person to just go wild and, uh, to the point where they will try to get, escape, get out, drive the person right out of the room. We're here in rainy Yonkers, New York. And this seminary is home to Dr. Richard E. Gallagher, a board-certified psychiatrist who in 2008 documented what he calls an authentic case of demonic possession. I am a, I am a practicing Catholic and uh, I'm open to the idea that uh, probably the best explanation here uh, seems to be a demonic phenomena. Tell me about the case of Julia, not her real name. She called herself a uh, member of a satanic cult. Uh, I believe satanic cults are very rare, but I think she was the genuine article. And uh, she sought out the help of some priests because uh, she was worried about her involvement with the cult at that point. But she also thought that she was probably possessed. The priest asked myself as a board certified psychiatrist to talk to her. The traditional criteria, and this has been the traditional criteria of uh, many churches, especially the Catholic Church for centuries, 
that one should uh, have a doctor uh, see the case, uh, generally. And that certain signs, in addition to the trance state with the voice, which expresses hostile and uh, irreligious comments, you will often expect to see abnormal strength. You will expect to see some kind of hidden knowledge, be able to speak in foreign languages. All those features were clearly present in this case. And all of a sudden, uh, she would kind of space out, uh, seemingly. And uh, out of her would come these, these voices. They would say things like, uh, leave her alone, uh, we hate you, you'll never get her. Joining us here on The Conspiracy Show is the priest who performed the exorcism on the woman we're calling Julia. Now, for the purposes of this interview, we'll identify him as Father A. Uh, Father A, can you tell me about your first meeting with this woman we're calling Julia? The priest called me with regards to phenomena that had taken place. He asked me if we would talk. I said, sure, no. Uh, he put her on another phone. She was very uh, sarcastic. What led her to believe she might have been demonically possessed? Well, she told us that she was having some weird experiences and that at times she was blacking out. Uh, she was going into some kind of a trance state. She had reported, without being able to remember it herself, that when she was in these trance state, people were telling her a voice would come out of her, of which she had no recollection. When you met her, did she exhibit any of those types of behaviors? Periodically, uh, she would go into a trance. Uh, she would kind of space out, uh, seemingly. And uh, out of her would come these, these voices. Um, now, these voices were clearly, you know, using her vocal cords, but they sounded different, you know. Um, and they would, they would say things like, uh, leave her alone, uh, we hate you, uh, you're worthless. Uh, mostly speaking to the priest. Uh, you're stupid, you'll never help her, you'll never, you'll never get her. Did she exhibit hidden knowledge? I was in the bedroom of my house with my wife and uh, we have a couple of cats and they were sleeping with us on the bed. She would tell things that she wasn't aware of prior to my having met her. I had not revealed anything about my family life, my priesthood to her. The cats uh, awakened us because all of a sudden they seemed to kind of go a little berserk fighting each other and you know these are not cats who fight each other they're relatively placid. She evidenced knowledge about where I was working on another case spoke about my mother that was not knowledge that she was privy to. The next morning uh, Julia said to us uh, how did you like those cats last night? Uh, somewhat of a uh, upsetting experience. He's claiming that someone is actually possessed by a demon and that there's sort of um, real proof this is the real case when in fact science has never authenticated a single case of such joe nickel is here from the committee for skeptical inquiry i had a conversation with a board-certified psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Richard Gallagher, who practices in uh, Valhalla, New York. And he wrote a piece in a Catholic publication, I believe it's called the New Oxford Review. And the title of the article was A Case of Demonic Possession. Now here, presumably, is a man of science. But because one person is convinced, and he may, I, I don't know whether he's a Roman Catholic or has, you know, some other a background, but I mean, there, there are eccentrics in every field of science. Many of them looked at askance by their their peers, anthropologists who believe in Bigfoot and go out and make mo the most outrageous and silly comments uh, to the criticism of their peers. I just would want more information. Uh, I, I, I think the burden shouldn't be put on skeptics to explain something that's not well reported. Explain the methods that you used in order to determine that she was not, as you say, 
psychiatrically disturbed? Well, I'm a very experienced uh, psychiatrist, so uh, essentially I just did a normal psychiatric uh, exam and interview. Uh, she was a, a very logical person. She was not in any way psychotic. She was not particularly depressed. There were several other mental health people who concurred with my feeling that this was not a person with psychiatric issues. We don't know why there were noises in the old house. Therefore, it was a ghost. We don't know what the bright light in the sky was last evening. Therefore, it's a flying saucer from Mars. Now, you can see right away this idea of saying, well, we don't know, therefore, we do know. It's, it's nonsense. What would you say to a skeptic who might suggest, well, Dr. Gallagher is a Roman Catholic, so of course he has a certain bias which might lead him to conclude that this was an authentic case of demonic possession. Uh, I come from uh, the Catholic tradition, which, which some of whose members believe in this stuff, some of whom are skeptical. People should keep in mind that 70% of Americans, you know, believe in the devil, and um, that's a large percentage. So my beliefs in this area, I think, are a bit more mainstream than many people would suppose. Uh, and I know quite a few doctors and psychiatrists uh, including the chairman of my uh, Department of Psychiatry, who was the former president of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, who absolutely uh, uh, believes in the same things I do. And this uh, boy had called his father that morning to tell him that this demon was telling him to start killing people. And he said, I don't want to hurt anybody, but it's going to hurt me if I don't do what it tells me. Typically, someone who is possessed, will they levitate? Uh, after I previewed the movie The Exorcist, I got a phone call from a woman who said that uh, uh, what was she saw on the screen was what had been happening to her three-year-old daughter. And I got there, and the little girl was sitting still in a crib, bouncing like a basketball. You want to move? In other words, she wasn't jumping herself. She wasn't moving a muscle. And as she was moving up and down, she was cursing and swearing. What about superhuman strength? Ah, yes. Uh, I had about, just about maybe five or six years ago, I had a young man, well, I said, father fool me. And his 21-year-old son, who weighed about 150 pounds, could lift a loaded transport trailer up in the air and drop it. I couldn't even lift a tire. And this uh, boy had called his father that morning to tell him that this demon was telling him to start killing people. And he said, I don't want to hurt anybody, but it's going to hurt me if I don't do what it tells me. His father asked me, can you help us? And I said, certainly, I can. He said, but this is a very strong and powerful one. And I said, I know, but as long as we do it the right way, the son will be set free. We had known that uh, Julia returned to her hometown for a while, which was in a southern state of the United States. We were up in the New York area. Uh, but I was talking to one of the exorcists involved about what the next step was, planning to arrange an exorcism. So I'm speaking to him uh, on the telephone line from my house. Uh, Julia is literally, you know, more than a thousand miles away at the time. We knew that for a fact. And as I'm talking to him over the phone, this voice comes in over the phone line. And it was the exact same sounding voice as one would hear during the trances, which I mentioned. And the voice expressed the same thing, you know, leave her alone, she's ours, you'll never release her, you're worthless, stupid priest. Also during the exorcism, I was told that she was speaking in Latin and she was speaking in uh, other foreign languages that I knew from discussions with her. Uh, Julia had no knowledge of these languages. These people can be interviewed. I mean, people don't have to take my word for it. You know, these people would confirm this story. Dr. Gallagher, once again, is not a linguist. He's claiming that, that okay, she spoke in these languages. She says she didn't know them. This is, a, this is nearly a miracle. Well, not really. And when real linguists have studied this whole phenomenon, none of it is inexplicable to science. And the cases that seem too good to be true, 
well, are probably too good to be true and they don't have any real, real evidence or real support. People have actually died during exorcisms, but it's, it's dangerous to our whole culture. It represents a lapsing back into a kind of medieval mindset. For the non-believer, yeah. they might ask, well, why doesn't someone capture one of these possessions on videotape? Have you ever thought of, of filming one of these things to convince people? I, I, it's such a personal thing for the people involved that, uh, that uh, they're, they're even embarrassed that it happened. And um, so I, it's, it's, like, it's like I maintain that Christian well, worship services should not be seen on television. I think that's uh, it's too personal a thing that should not be done there. And uh, when it does, people look at it and there's some things they will understand, other things they won't, and then they just end up mocking it all. Or, or even if you tape something, uh, they say, well, they accuse you of making it up. You know, you, you, like a play. I have uh, met people and talked with them and investigated cases in which people claim to be possessed or claim to have formerly been possessed. In every case that I'm aware of, the person is simply uh, role-playing. And they are uh, highly represented among people who believe that they're psychics who have a personal ghost in their house, uh, who talk to the Holy Virgin Mary on a regular basis and so forth. And again, if they're not psychotic, not out of touch with reality, they, and they may seem perfectly sane and normal. I think there are psychiatrists who talk about something called pseudo-possession, uh, you know, some suggestible individual who thinks they're possessed but are not. Uh, there was a uh, concept called multiple personality disorder, which is now generally called dissociative identity disorder. Uh, patients kind of elaborate some kind of uh, disturbed personality. Uh, there are clearly many psychotic individuals who think they are being attacked by uh, the devil or, or, or see the devil or see God or whatever, and we know that they're, the explanation for their problems is, is uh, invariably you know, psychiatric, and, and they often respond to medication. But the features uh, shown by uh, this remarkable case of Julia went so far beyond uh, any natural or medical explanation that uh, I concluded it must be something more, and the priests agreed with me that uh, in their official view, this was a demonic possession. An exorcism would be in order. What happened to Julia? Were the exorcisms successful? Uh, Julia decided not to continue. Uh, I'm not entirely sure whether she um, got scared, but she did drop out, and of course this is, this is her choice. Uh, about a year later, she told us that she did want to take up the exorcisms again. And uh, the, the priest who most closely worked with her, he asked her, well, why do you want to resume at this point? And Julia said, because I'm dying because I've been diagnosed as, as having cancer and I really want to be delivered before I die. So I spoke to Julia on the phone. I said to her, well, uh, you know, I really need to speak to your doctor. I need to confirm this, this diagnosis. She wasn't sure that she wanted to get her doctor involved, uh, but that she would get back to us. Uh, she never got back to us. We never quite knew what happened to her. Can you talk to me about the, the dangers of exorcism? We could be ignorant, superstitious, believe dogmas, uh, be superstitious, believe in the supernatural, believe the devil's going to get you. And, and that, that's, that may be good for business for a particular religious dogma, but it's, it's anti-science. The good news about it is this. If there, is, if there are no demons there, there's no harm done. People have actually died during exorcisms. But it's, it's dangerous to our whole culture. It represents a lapsing back into a kind of medieval mindset. Don't necessarily believe me. Uh, I'm just uh, stating what uh, a number of the people who are involved with myself could easily state as well. Um, decide for yourself. But when I say decide for yourself, you know, don't just parrot the beliefs of your family or your educational system. You know, really keep an open mind, look at the facts, um, decide whether the facts have some credibility, and then make up your own mind. That would be my advice. 
I don't know about you, but when a board-certified psychiatrist goes on record as saying he witnessed an authentic case of demonic possession, I stand up and take notice. I spoke by phone to Father A. He corroborated everything that Dr. Gallagher said, from Julia's levitation, to her knowledge of Latin, to her frightening paranormal abilities. And what are we to make of the Reverend Gordon Williams, a graduate of the prestigious seminary at Princeton University? Is he making this all up? And Joe Nickel, he presented an articulate, well-reasoned argument against demonic possession. Reason and scientific inquiry are invaluable and absolutely necessary. But do reason and scientific inquiry even apply? Can they even apply when we're talking about the spirit world, the supernatural? The French poet Baudelaire wrote that the devil's greatest trick was to convince the world he doesn't exist. I believe we ignore that at our peril. And now, we'd like to know what you think. You can contact us here at The Conspiracy Show through our website, www.theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't be afraid. Move over, Aphrodite, I'm coming home. Good night. Mm -hmm.